If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, just so I know who you are. Yes, you mentioned uh, press freedom. Um, I think Kazakhstan has a quite a poor record on press freedom. I think it's in the press freedom index. It's something like a 176 country for uh, th this problem. And there are people who think that um, the press freedom is actually being increasingly limited and restricted. And you will know about the um, closure of the Respublika um, newspaper in Arlati. Could you say something a bit more about how the United States is combating this issue? Well, thank you. First of all, I, I agree with your assessment. Um, we, we do see that um, press freedoms are being more constrained now. And uh, so this is certainly something that I'll be talking about today with um, our friends in the government and with uh, civil society with whom I'll be meeting later. later. You know, and I, I see this as part of a, a wider um, trend, not just in Kazakhstan, in, but in the broader region where there, I think there's a more constrained space for civil society as a whole. Uh, and I, I, we see that as uh, quite risky. Uh, at, at this sensitive time in, um, in the history of Central Asia and the his history of what's going on in Afghanistan and what's going on in Russia, we think it's very, very important to reverse that trend and to provide more opportunities, to provide more space for civil society, and that that in itself is going to be more stabilizing by helping um, people to voice their grievances in a peaceful way, to allow for peaceful religious, religious worship, to allow for more open press, and to allow for more open civil society. So that's a message that I convey both privately and publicly, uh, not just here in Kazakhstan, but in other parts of Central Asia. But uh, I thank you very much for raising that. I would say first of all, I understand your political sense, and so I'm not a student, and uh, I have a question. You mentioned the, um, the, this challenge between liberalizing trade between countries in Central Asia, and also uh, on, the, on one hand. And on, that, on the other hand is the problem of uh, trafficking of narcotics. And so, could you say something more specific, please, about how, how does this international cooperation in terms of combating and preventing uh, drug trade and uh, trafficking of narcotics, um, what are the efforts, what are the specific efforts being done in terms of improving the capacity of the law enforcement uh, agencies or uh, other business actors in, in terms of uh, in fighting this uh, evil thing? Well, there are actually several parallel lines of effort that are underway. Um, first is the one you referred to, which is the imperative to um, provide for more open trade regimes. And uh, the first line of effort there is to uh, encourage all of the countries to accede to the World Trade Organization. And as I mentioned in my remarks, I think there's been quite good progress on that, and we hope that Kazakhstan will be able to exceed later this year. Uh, but a second um, very important part of that is to the sort of all the practical work that needs to be done um, at, for example, at the border areas to, um, to allow for customs harmonization, to reduce the delays that trucks, for example, have to face uh, at, every, at, every, at every border crossing, to reduce corruption. In many states in Central Asia, truckers have to pay uh, you know, various kinds of informal taxes and other things on a very frequent basis to, to continue to, to move their goods through these countries. Obviously, that is a barrier to, to trade in, in, in these countries. So um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that. Um, we're, but we're also very conscious of the fact that um, as we provide uh, more opportunities for trade, that also gives opportunities for uh, criminals and for terrorists to take advantage of that as well. And so that's why it's, it's critically important to increase our work with governments and with regional organizations like CARIC to help provide information exchange, but more, even more critically for us to build up our law enforcement cooperation and, and ideally intelligence cooperation as well so that we can share information not only bilaterally 
but across borders as well. So that, for example, if we hear about a, a big drug shipment that's coming from Afghanistan, that, that people all along the, the projected route can be aware of that and try to interdict it. And then also, obviously, take steps to shut down the, the network that is running that. So there's a, there are both tremendous opportunities, but also still tremendous challenges that need to be uh, undertaken. And again, I think uh, we're, we're, we really want to continue to increase our cooperation with Kazakhstan uh, on these, because again, many of these international organizations are based here in Almaty, things like, like Carrick, where a lot of this information exchange has to take place. There is a lot of concerns of, uh, in the United States and in different journals about the universities uh, that are allowed the partnership with Nagarabak University because as uh, written in those magazines, uh, the United States as a democracy cannot uh, and the values of those universities in the United States as uh, uh, not to have uh, such a tight relationship with authoritarian universities in authoritarian states. And uh, what do you think about the attitude of these magazines and how it could affect the partnership of uh, two countries? Moreover, I am concerned about the question about the statistics. Uh, is, uh, by the statistic, Kazakhstan is not so far in the, uh, uh, repressing the personal freedoms from the Iran and Iraq. And uh, <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it really yeah. so? <laughs> and, <laughs> How do you think, uh, how we can change this attitude? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, for those of you who didn't hear, the first question was about um, what, what is the attitude about, um, I, guess, I guess a magazine of some sort has, has raised some questions about whether the United States should be partnering with universities like Nazarbayev in, in foreign countries. And I, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with the magazine you, you talked about, but. I can speak from the U.S. government in saying that we strongly support um, efforts by various American universities to establish more uh, partnerships with organizations and universities like Nazarbayev University. As I said in my remarks, I think there are already about eight American universities that have partnerships of one sort or another. We, we would like to see that number increase and we'd like to see the the, the quality is uh, increased as well, so that more kind of twinning programs, and joint degrees, and various other programs would be possible in the longer term. Uh, and this is part of, and, and again, we're we're really supporting the interests of our universities, who themselves, I think, increasingly are interested in attracting uh, not only students from Kazakhstan, but also a very wide range of, of students from around the world. They want to have a diverse. Um, student body in the United States, uh, wonderful students like all of you who speak such good English, bring such a new perspective uh, to students from in the United States, many of whom have never had the chance to travel overseas before uh, and don't understand a, a lot about, about regions like Central Asia. So you are not only ambassadors, but in, in a way professors uh, to teach about your country and about Central Asia. And uh, that's, a, that's such a valuable part of, of the the university experience for people. And uh, you know, when I went to, to Harvard and when I went to SICE, some of my best friends were the people from all over the world that I met, and many of whom I still keep in touch with. So, uh, so for that reason, we strongly support these kinds of exchange programs and these kinds of partnerships that American universities are building up. Sorry, what was the second question? Sorry, about the rating of Kazakhstan between the authoritarian states, why uh, is it really is there really so much of oppressing of human rights in Kazakhstan, like in Iraq or in Iran, according to CIA, even CIA <laughs> database? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you, you, there's a very different situation here and, and what, what's taking place in Iran. But um, in a way, we, you know, we, we have high expectations of Kazakhstan, because, uh, precisely because your country has come so far in 20 years. Uh, and precisely because your country does seek to be now not only a regional leader, but a global leader. So uh, it's important that your country therefore sort of set an example and um, that political progress keep pace with the economic progress that you've made. And that will ensure uh, continued stability in your country, 
and will ensure that, again, your country will continue to be able to grow. Uh, and that's why I think we put such an emphasis on this. But I will say we have a very positive and open dialogue with the government about this, and I'm pleased that the government also has a very good dialogue with Kazakhstani civil society as well. Uh, and that's something that we, we attach a lot of importance to. You have a question, I do have a question. Uh, as you probably know, the, uh, the trade union with Kazakhstan and Russia and Belarus uh, is fairly new and fairly strong. And uh, while automobiles, for example, produced within this trade union can be purchased at a reasonable price here, uh, you're hard pressed to find a Ford here that you can buy for um, any kind of reasonable dollar. And uh, so I'm wondering what the, the introduction of Kazakhstan into the WTO would have on the import of such goods as Western cars um, and so forth, which are currently um, imposed with customs duties that are, that are quite severe. Well, we, we have several strategic interests here. One of our strategic interests is to support this, uh, this economic transition in Afghanistan that I've talked about. And that to do that, we really need to see much greater uh, open trading regimes so that Afghanistan can be kind of more integrated into its regional neighborhood. Um, and so, but we also um, want to make sure that there, in the wider region, there's also opportunities for greater trade and investment. Um, and many have expressed concern about the customs union that you, that you mentioned. Uh, and so we, we've expressed our interest to our friends in Russia that um, there's nothing inherently wrong with the customs union, we want, but we don't want to have it exclude American companies. And, and, uh, and so as long as there's open trading regimes, then, then we will support that kind of thing. So they, for the record, they, they say that their objective is not to exclude the United States or other countries. But nonetheless, the WTO is, a, is, is an insurance policy in a way to ensure that should there be such res restrictive trade practices, the WTO obligations under the WTO would always trump ob obligations under a customs union. So that's why we strongly support. Uh, that's the second strong reason why we support these these uh, these particular these you know the, the WTO accession. Um, so um, you know we'll, we'll we'll continue to work on this, and my hope is that yes, over time. Um, we will be able to encourage more American investment in, in this part of the world, and it will be able to see uh, a diversification of the kinds of investments that uh, Kazakhstan is able to attract from the United States. Now it's mostly in the oil and gas sector, uh, and over time there's a possibility of developing um, more in, in, let's say, the transport sector, in uh, various kinds of manufacturing, um, but it's also incumbent upon the government to, to create the most open uh, investment regime possible as well, so that uh, you know, governments will have the incentive and, and companies will have the incentives to invest here. So that's another very important part of our dialogue. quite a lot of progress that's already been made uh, with the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, to establish this nuclear fuel bank here in, um, in Kazakhstan. I, you know, obviously some things still need to be resolved, but uh, I think quite a lot of progress has been made and the United States certainly supports the, the establishment of the fuel bank here. Um, with respect to security, that's one of the, the, the the things that have to be agreed on in advance is what kind of security arrangements will be established to uh, to ensure that there is security for that particular facility. But again, I'm, I'm confident of the ability of of the Kazakhstani authorities to provide the necessary security. And I don't I don't think the threat comes from Russia or China. No, 
it would be more from uh, you know a terrorist organization or something like that. If I could just add something, I, I know in the Kazakhstani press that this is sometimes not terribly accurately presented. The LEU fuel bank is going at a facility that already processes uranium. And in fact, Kazakhstan is the world's largest supplier of uranium. They do it safely and they do it reliably. The total size of the LEU fuel bank is equal to about 1% of the amount of Kazakhstani fuel that's already there. So how much does it change security profile? Basically nothing. Um, this is not a huge difference. This is an enormous facility that will be able to house this important international uh, non-proliferation effort that will just take up a tiny corner. Uh, it's really not a huge difference in already existing operations. Good morning. Uh, thank you for your interesting lecture, and um, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, my question uh, is, uh, well, let me start that uh, in this uh, period of globalization, of course, it is good that countries help each other to prosper, to develop, and I really appreciate this process. Uh, nevertheless, um, I just want to, I wanted to clarify one question in my mind. Um, would you agree uh, that uh, when uh, a particular country uh, is, uh, has some policy uh, about emphasizing control of some domestic issues of another country, uh, would you agree that uh, somehow uh, it uh, could contradict the United Nations Charter about the intervention to domestic policy? Um, thank you. Uh, sorry, is that, is that a question about human rights and to what extent countries have a right to talk to other countries about human rights issues? Uh, you, you can be straight. <laughs> <laughs> um, just uh, about uh, well about the interest uh, interest and control of. Uh, governmental issues of another country, could it contradict somehow the United Nations Charter about domestic intervention to domestic policy? Right. Well, I'll just say, the, you know, the United States has, has always strongly upholded the values of democracy and human rights around the world. Uh, it's the principles on which our own nation was founded. But, um, but we also think that this is an important part of uh, we, if you mentioned the UN, uh, preserving peace and security is to uphold uh, very high standards for human rights and democracy. In addition, you have in Central Asia uh, the OSC principles that, that Central Asian countries have, have signed themselves up to, uh, to, to uphold. So, um, so I don't think that we're, you know, un, we're, we're interfering in the, in the domestic affairs of, of countries. We're, on the contrary, seeking to strengthen their societies and thereby strengthen our own partnerships and strengthen the sustainability of, of, of your countries. And um, we try to do this in a very respectful way, uh, but in a way also that, that uh, preserves our own, our own values and our own interests. Thank you. Mr. Blake, uh, it's such a big pleasure to meet you. My name is Emin, uh, Department of Students Affairs, and as we mentioned, Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, I have just one question, uh, which bothers many people. Uh, for a long period of time, uh, <clears throat> many countries were fight against drug traffic, and are there any real solutions that can be done uh, against this problem? Well, you're right. I mean, it, it, this is a problem that we in the United States have faced for so many years. Um, so there's no magic solution. Um, there, con there continues to be a, a very substantial demand for various kinds of drugs in the United States. And as long as there's that demand, criminals are going to find a way to, uh, to make money to circumvent whatever controls we have put in place to try to prevent uh, the import of drugs. And it's the same way here or in any other country. So, um, so it requires a very comp comprehensive solution, both on the, on the demand side, but also on the supply side uh, with, with respect to law enforcement cooperation uh, and, 
it's particularly challenging in a country like Afghanistan that is so poor to begin with, where many farmers don't have uh, too many alternatives. We've, um, we've made a great effort to try to um, provide alternatives, particularly in the agricultural sector, which is uh, one of the largest sectors in, in Afghanistan, so that um, farmers, for example, have the incentives to, to uh, produce food crops instead of heroin. Uh, I think we've enjoyed some success, but there's still a, a very long way to go. Uh, but I think that the part of it here with respect to Kazakhstan and the other Central Asian countries is, again, to work on these border controls, uh, to work on a greater transparency, to make sure that um, uh, there's, a, there's good information flow uh, within countries between our respective law enforcement agencies, but also between uh, those. And I, I'd say that's where there's still much more that needs to be done so that there's good cooperation between Central Asian countries uh, and between countries like the United States and Russia who have an interest in this, so that a, a, a really a comprehensive effort can be uh, forged to, to address this problem. But you're right, it's a very, very complicated uh, problem and one that we've, we've had, I'd say, modest success so far in, um, in addressing. Good morning, thank you for your today's talk. And <clears throat> I have a question like uh, WTO. Uh, you have already said that thank you. Uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Kazakhstan uh, shows great interest to, uh, to join this organization. And besides preventing uh, drug traffic of narcotics in Central Asian region, what are the final steps that Kazakhstan or, probably, or particularly we citizens, citizens of Kazakhstan should provide in order to join this organization as early as possible. Thank you. Well, your um, your trade minister, Ms. Ajanova, is, is uh, very uh, very diligently and energetically uh, pursuing your interests, and uh, this is a very complicated process because there's there's bilateral agreements that have to be signed with every uh, country. But I think uh, you, you've made a lot of progress. I think the, the, the kind of the sticking points now are uh, the kind of phase in um, procedures and, and, and various, there's still some sectoral disagreements as well. Um, but I, overall, I think that your country has made quite a, a lot of progress. And again, the hope is that, that uh, uh, Kazakhstan will be able to exceed by later this year or early next year. And that's something, again, that the United States strongly supports and has supported for many years. Mr. Blake, I would like to uh, ask you about this very important act, Freedom Support Act, which was initiated by Senator Bradley in 1991, and so introduced in 1992, under which really thousands of young people from the Soviet bloc including Kazakhstan, former Soviet bloc, and Eastern bloc, actually participated in all kinds of change programs, not only students, but also uh, other people, as you already mentioned. But, of course, it has been already more than 20 years. It's not lasted. What do you think about the position of the um, government of the United States? Um, are you interested in continuing these program, programs? Because I would like to say that we have more than 40 flex students studying here as Bolosh, as uh, under Nazarbayev University students. And we can see that they have better English, of course, and um, they are more open, and they have their own club. We have flex club at the university. And so I will appreciate if you well, thank you very much. I, you know, speaking personally, I think these these programs are among the most successful and important programs we have in the world. Uh, these these various kinds of exchange programs, and um, they continue to enjoy very strong support uh, in the State Department, and I think on Capitol Hill as well, because people very well understand the importance of having these kinds of exchanges, and uh, you know, it, it it helps us so much to have people come and spend serious amounts of time in the United States and really understand the United States and then to be able to come back to their countries and, 
help us to explain uh, our country and our values to, to others. So in, in many ways, you, you, the people who are on these exchange programs are such valuable bridges between our two societies, just as students are as well. So I, I, my, my sense is that we will continue to strongly support these. I will say that in Central Asia, um, we have seen uh, efforts, not, not in Kazakhstan, but in other parts of Central Asia, to actually restrict many of these exchange programs. And I think that's a great shame. Uh, because in, in some cases, governments are worried uh, about what kind of ideas, what kinds of freedoms uh, these, these students are going to be exposed to when they go to the United States. Are they then going to try to bring back those, uh, those ideas to, um, to try to change their own societies? And I, I think that's a misplaced fear. Uh, and uh, so again, we will, even though there are now some restrictions in some of these countries, we will continue to strongly support and advocate for these programs uh, and encourage uh, wide participation in, from Central Asians. Thank you very much.